Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this video, again, we're talking about tables. This time I want to talk about a way of updating the data in a table without affecting the underlying database until you hit a save button. So I'm just going to give you a demonstration of what I'm talking about. I have this table here that's full of embedded views. I'm going to change pending to active on server one, and it colors the entire row which indicates to the user that there's some unsaved data on this row. So additionally, I can add new rows and you see not only is the row orange, but certain cells are red, which is going to indicate required fields. Now I cannot edit the fields for my equipment where the record already exists in the database, but on this new record, I can edit fields. So I'm going to create a new test here. I'll make this a drilling machine pending note and shipping. Now I can also delete rows. So this row doesn't exist in my data set. When I hit the delete button, it's just going to drop off of the table. But if I were to delete test, because this is an existing row in my database, it's going to hold on to that row, but color it red to indicate to the user that this row is marked for deletion. Now, I could hit the refresh button and all of this would revert back to the way that it was. But I'm going to hit save and we should see server one become active. Test will drop off and I'll have a new piece of equipment called test two. And there you have it. Server one is active now. There's no longer a test piece of equipment, but I do have test two. The data property on this table looks as though it's just a normal JSON format. But if I expand any one of these rows, you'll see that most of my columns are actually objects instead of values like update me and delete me. These columns, by the way, I'm going to use later on in the script. I'll show you how I'm using those to determine what to do with the data in each of these rows. But if we take a look at any of these other columns, you'll see I have the same keys set up in each one display, action, style, value, and enabled. So when I'm using my embedded views, each one of these actually receives the full object with all of these keys as a parameter. Let me show you what that means. For machine one here, I'm not able to edit it right now because enabled is false, but if I turn enabled to true, now I can edit that field. And when I click off of it, it updates the row, indicating that there's unsaved data there. I can undo that. Additionally, I could toggle display and just hide that column. And then I could also change the style on it if I wanted to. I could do a background color of, say, green or red. Now, let's take a look at the columns really quickly because these columns are set up to use embedded views. And this is what that looks like. I have this render property set to view, and I'm passing in a view path, but I also have some view parameters. So this one is a Boolean for is required, and then this one here, source, I wanted to especially highlight because this is tying all of my embedded views to this specific table. If I scroll down a little bit more, I have a custom property here called table ID the value of one. So that's what all of the source parameters are. I have a source parameter in each one of my embedded views here. Let's take a look really quick at the view parameters for one of my dropdowns. They're slightly different from the text field. So I have parameters for allow custom options and show clear icon options and is required. But I also have that source parameter. The data property of the table is using a named query binding. And it has the return format of auto, which is a data set. And it's going to return a data set of all the records in my equipment table where the equipment status is not deleted. Then it's going to go through a script transform. So that returned value from the named query is going to get passed into a new function called set columns that we'll take a look at in a minute. Essentially, what I'm doing with that is creating the table's columns property and I'm returning it as a value and storing it in this columns variable. Then I have a variable called output, which is just an empty array, and I'm gonna loop through 
all of the rows in my data and create a variable called row value, which is equal to this object. Then I loop through all of my columns and I create a variable for the column name and the value using the incoming value that returned named query value and this get value at function, the row index, and the column name. Then I'm going to take the column name and create a new key in my row value object equal to this whole object here, which has value equal to cell value, action equal to update, enabled is true, display is true, and style is just this empty object. Then I check for the column equipment name because I want to turn the enabled property in this object to false so that they can't update the equipment name for an existing piece of equipment. Then I append this row value to my output and I return the output. This is that set columns function. This isn't necessary by any means. You can create your columns properties in a number of different ways. What's happening here is I'm passing in the data set. I'm creating the columns as an array and then I basically just loop through all of those column names and create the column object. Eventually, I just append that column object to my output and I set my tables columns property to that output. And I also return that output so that I can use it as the columns variable in my script transform. So this column object is just the default column object when you manually create a new column object. I'll show you what that looks like. If I come down to my columns and I hit the plus button, I have this default column object with nothing set in the field. If I right click that and hit copy, I want to delete it too. Back in the script, I would be able to paste that in here. I added the column name in there for the field, and I think I changed filter to be true. Then I'm setting individual column settings one by one here. So for my equipment name column, I'm setting the view path, uh, also setting some view params and changing the header title. Here's a drop down column. It's using this drop down view path oh, right there. It's also using this named query to return a list of options for the drop down. And then it has quite a few view params. So you kind of get the idea that's what each one of these elif statements is doing is just checking for a different column and setting up column object properties for that column. Here on the embedded view for my dropdown, let's take a look at the incoming parameters. Several of these are automatically passed into the embedded view just because I have them set up as incoming parameters here, but I didn't have to create them in the view params on my column object of the table. Those parameters are value, row index, row data, and column. So all of these other parameters I had to set up on the view params. I also have two custom properties that are both objects. Value is just trying to get all of these keys out of my value parameter. Because you remember that all of my columns in my data set are objects. And they look just like this, except it's missing the style, the style key. So value, if we look at the binding for this, value is just trying to extract the value key out of my value parameter. If it can't find it, it's just going to fall back to some default value, in this case, the, the value parameter itself. But I'm doing the same thing basically for enabled, display, and action, just trying to get that key out of the value parameter. And if I can't find it, falling back to some default value. Okay, the payload is taking new value from whatever's selected in the dropdown, taking this action from the custom value action, and then the rest of these it's getting directly from the parameters. So column, source, row data, row index, those are all coming directly from these parameters. On the dropdown component itself, value is coming from that custom value, dot value. Options is coming from the parameters, so is show clear icon and allow custom options. Display and enabled are also coming from the custom value. And then I have a custom style class set up here that's it's not necessary. We're not going to get into it. But on the component itself, I have an event set up. It's using the on action performed event, which is going to run a script. That script is just going to grab my payload custom property. And it's going to send that in a message called column action over the page scope. 
Now the text field embedded view is very similar. It's got my value and payload custom properties in there that are set up the exact same way. The only difference here is that there's slightly different incoming parameters. I also have this placeholder parameter. So on my text field, I can create that binding. Looks like I forgot that. Create that binding to my placeholder. So text is coming from the custom value dot value and enabled is also coming from that custom value dot enabled display same thing on this component though there is no on action performed event so send the message i have a change script this change script is excluding any time the value is updated from a binding it's also excluding any time the value is updated but it's the exact same value that it was previously otherwise it's going to take the custom payload property and send it in a message called column action over the page scope Here's the message handler that's going to receive all of the messages from my embedded views. And I have at the start here some variables for source, action, row data, row index, and column that all come from the payload. Then I have a variable for columns, which is the table components columns property. Next, I'm going to check if the payload source is this tables table ID. If it is, then I'm going to check for which action I need to perform. I only have one action right here, but I could have multiple in the future. But if the action is update, then I'm gonna create this new value object. It's got the keys value equal to my payloads new value action, which is update, enabled, true, display, true, and then style is this object with a background color. Then I'm going to set the column at the row in my data to my new value, this object here. I'm updating the column object in my data. And then I'm also going to set the update me column in this row of my data to true. And then loop through all of my columns. And in this row of the data, set each column's style background color to that warning secondary color variable. The script on the add button is pretty straightforward. You just have variables for the table and columns, this row style. And then I have this empty object called new row. And then as I loop through all of the columns, I'm creating a new key in that new row object for each of the column names and setting that equal to this entire object here. Next, I'm also gonna create keys for update me, which will be true and delete me, which will be false. And lastly, I'm just going to append my new row to the data property of my table. Next, we have the script for the delete button which is set up pretty similarly. It's got variables for table, and columns. This time it also has a selected row and data variable, all coming from that table component. I'm checking to see if the selected row is none, and if it is, then I just stop what I'm doing. Otherwise, if selected row is not none, then I'm gonna check, see if the value for my equipment ID column in the selected row, if that's none, then I wanna just delete that row outright from the table. It doesn't need to be there anymore because it's a brand new row, it's not existing in the data set yet, so it's just going to disappear. But if that value for my equipment ID is not none, then it's an existing row in the data set, it has an ID. So I'm going to set the delete me key in that row to true, and then I'm going to loop through all of the columns in that row, and set the styles background color to this variable var error, which is the deep red color. Real quick, this is what the refresh button looks like. I'm just refreshing the data property on my table and setting the selected row and the selected column both to none. The script on the save button starts off with variables for user ID, T stamp, the table component, and the data and columns properties on that table component. Then I have a variable for my transaction, TXID. This transaction I'm going to use with all of the queries in this script to package them up together and execute them all at once as opposed to one at a time. Then I have a try statement and I loop through all of the rows in my data. On each row, I'm going to create an equipment ID, delete me, and update me variable. Those are using the values from the row. And I'm going to check if delete me is true. If it is, then I want to delete this row. So I 
create my arguments. My arguments include a user ID and T stamp, as well as that equipment ID that I'm going to delete because I'm actually not deleting it. In this case, I'm just updating a status on my uh, record there. All right, and then lastly, I'm going to execute that query using the transaction ID. If delete me is not true, then I'm gonna check if equipment ID is none. If it is none, then that means it's a new record. I don't have an existing ID for that record, so I need to insert it. So I create an array, an empty array called temp, and another empty array for my arguments. And then I loop through all of my columns. If I'm on the column equipment ID, I'm going to ignore it outright because I don't want to enter a null for my equipment ID. Next, I'm going to check for the column FK insert user ID. This is just the name of my column for capturing the, the, the user who created this record. So I'm going to append to my arguments the value of my user ID variable, and I'm going to append to my temp array the name of that column. I'm going to do the same thing for insert T stamp, append the T stamp variable to my arguments, and append the name insert T stamp to my temp array. And then for any other column, I'm going to append to my args the value of that column and the value or and the column name is going to go into the temp array. Next, I'm creating a string out of that temp array. I'm separating it, all of those elements, with a comma and returning it as a string using this join function. And I'm doing the same thing for this value string here, joining this array that I've created here. It's just an array of question marks for each column or each yeah, column name in this temp array, separating them by a comma and returning that as a string. Then I'm going to put those strings, the column string and value string into this query using the format function. And they're gonna go in place of these curly brackets there. Lastly, for this section, I am running the query using that transaction ID. Now, if delete me is false and equipment ID is not none, then I wanna check if update me is true. If it is, then once again, I'm going to create an empty array for temp and args. I'm gonna loop through all of my columns and once again, check for that equipment ID column so that I can ignore it. I don't wanna update my equipment ID. Then I'm checking for this foreign key update user ID column. For this column, I'm going to append my user ID variable to my arguments and then append this string to my temp array. This string is going to have the column name in place of these curly brackets by using this format function. And I'm gonna do the same thing for the update T stamp column. My T stamp variable goes into my args and this string with the column name equal to a question mark goes into my temp array. And then for any other column, just going to take the value, put it into the args, take the column name equal to a question mark, put it in the temp array. And then before my query, I have this additional append statement to my arguments where I'm adding the equipment ID at the very end of my arguments so that I only update that specific row. Then I'm also formatting a comma separated string of all of those strings that we added to the temp array. So column name equals question mark separated by a comma. That's going to go in place of these curly brackets. And then I'm running the query using the transaction ID. So if everything works out, once I'm done looping through all of the rows in my data, I'm going to commit the transaction. And I have a little print statement here letting me know that it successfully committed the transaction. If for whatever reason it fails, there's an error. I have this accept statement, which is going to capture the exception in a variable called E, roll back the transaction, and then give me some feedback in this print statement saying, hey, rolled back the transaction, and I'm formatting in that error message. Finally, whether everything succeeds or fails, I'm going to close the transaction. I have a little print statement telling me that I've closed the transaction, and then I'm just refreshing the data property on my table. Well, I hope that this video was helpful to you and that you found it interesting. If you have any questions or comments or ideas for future videos that you'd like to see us make, drop a comment down below. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and click the like button if you'd like to see more videos like this. And we'll see you in the next one.